We have this capacity and we're meant to live in it. So it's already there. All we have to do is re-strengthen it. We fed the fear. We haven't fed the peace and calm because we didn't know how. What's up, everyone? You're listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. The purpose of this show is to share stories of hardship and victory as an encouragement for those in the middle of their own hard thing. Because we know hardship produces perseverance, which produces character, which ultimately produces hope. Today's guest is Jill Tupper. Jill is a widely recognized keynote speaker known for her emphasis on body, mind, and spirit. She's currently leading trips to the war zone of Ukraine through her organization, Global Warriors, powered by love, to help train people to manage trauma. In our conversation, Jill shares about a 10-year season of loss after loss after loss that caused her to doubt God and his goodness. She reminds us that even the deepest of valleys has a tremendous purpose, whether we see it at the time or not. If you enjoy the show, please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review so more people can be encouraged by the stories we share. Now, here's the conversation with Jill Tupper. Okay, we got Jill Tupper on the Do Hard Things podcast. Uh, Super happy to have you and looking forward to hearing your story. Thanks for being here. I'm already excited. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Well, uh, let's give people context for who you are. And I like to do that by, by asking the question, when people ask you what you do, Hmm. what do you tell them? How do you answer it? (laughs) Well, that's a little different these days. Um, (laughs) you know, I tell them I work in the area of neuroscience, um, where we actually help, um, preempt trauma, before people become traumatized. So this has been an evolution of my work throughout the years, several decades of work. And now we've seen it be incredibly successful, literally in the war zone of Ukraine. Mm. So not a lot of people, I actually don't know if it's a lot. It seems like not a lot of people would be in the neuroscience world uh, or necessarily set out to be in the neuroscience. It seems it's becoming more and more popular, like, you know, psychology and neuroscience. And I think with Andrew Huberman and some of these folks that have these larger platforms, but, uh, when did you know that's what you wanted to do and how long have you been like in neuroscience? Well, I think it's such a cool question because I think life is about planting seeds and then you don't know kind of exactly what that plant's going to look like when you Mm -hmm. got an idea, right? You've got an idea of what it could look like. So What's really cool is my background is in occupational therapy. So that's an area that I loved working with spinal cord patients. Well, the spine is the electrical panel and it literally is the neuroscience center, basically, right? The neuropathway center of the entire body and how it functions. So back before neuroscience was a cool thing, I was sort of a geek in this area (laughs) and then my master's is in leadership. And so I've always been this gal, uh, that saw that our mind, our bodies, our emotions, and our spirits, our purpose all come together. And for decades, people have said, pick a lane, Tupper, pick a lane. And I was like, (laughs) and together it's bringing him into sync. And so I've related it most of my life in the area of like training for a triathlon, right? So you, you run, you bike, uh, you swim, actually it's reversed. You swim, you bike, you run is the, the, um, so you don't die swimming. And I've done a handful of, uh, triathlons through my days and marathons and outrigger racing, these kinds of things. And so you not only, you're usually great in one sport. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Like I'm a great runner. Uh, but then you kind of are okay in the other and you suck in the third. So that's what I see people in today's world. Like we're either great with the mind or we're great with the body or we're great with the emotions or we're great with the soul, but we don't know how to bring them into sync. And we usually suck in one of those. So it's about training all three and the transitions between. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure there's so many other uh, rabbit holes we could go down on a lot of the, (laughs) what we're talking about. It's so interesting, but I want to go back to the trauma piece that you're talking about. 
and you know what how this is all kind of culminated to what you're doing now mm -hmm. can you explain in a little more detail you know how you work through trauma with neuroscience and uh, helping people process and you know practically what does it look like yeah i think that's a really good question um so what's happened is, you know, my leadership piece was all about, um, you know, the, the courses I would teach at the Rady Center of Executive Development at UCSD were um, leadership is a triathlon, body, mind, business, or uh, conquer crisis, train like a triathlete, body, mind, purpose. And in many ways, it was bringing all three of those together. But what we discovered and um, and this was literally proven in the war zone of Ukraine, which I know we're going to get to in a second, but we'd already proven it in the battlefield of the mind in the U.S. So what I discovered is that there's this slice of actually a natural neural pathway we already have within us. That neural pathway is designed to help us toggle between high alerts, alert system Okay. And you don't have to worry about the technology of it, meaning sympathetic system. And then we have a calm state. And, but that state of homeostasis needs to happen for the body to go back into its natural, healthy, what would I call it? Um, uh, re, re, the body's made to kind of replenish itself. So it needs yeah. to go back to that state. Yeah. So um, you, we've got this amygdala, right? So we've got this high level alarm system in our bodies. And it's awesome. It's brilliant. We need it. We all can't live without it. But if it stays on, it's like driving your freaking car at 100 miles an hour, you know, pedal to the metal the whole way. And then what happens? Transmission falls out. Same thing with us. Yeah. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. A little bit. So, so is the, what you're doing then is trying to get people to not drive at 100 miles an hour. With. Yeah, what we do is reconnect them to the part of the body that we have a natural um, neural pathway in. Okay, our natural neural pathway we can go to high alert, and then we're meant to go back into right. rest state so the body can replenish, restore. Um, and normally, if we're in high alert for a while, the first thing I see this is more what I see literally in war zones is the body releases. The mind and body together release, then it goes into rest, then it goes into um, a beginning to restore, and then it has a reset. Mm -hmm. Then they can toggle between when they need the high alert system. But every day, what we've discovered is that people have been living at this heightened state of anxiety and overwhelm for a long period of time, globally, yeah. by the way. Mm. So that's not specific just to a war zone. That is just like everyday life. People are anxious and stressed and high alert. Amygdala is on and not returning back to home. So if it's global, is it like the assumed culprits, like social media, iPhones, screens? Oh, like what is causing sure. it? I mean, yeah, that's that's a contributing factor but um, at, at the pace the world is going, okay. it heightens that state of alerts. The rate that messages and information comes at us, it's much, much, much higher. But yeah. also we've shown that we've had more tolerance and we tend to be more connected to devices rather than to nature. So that's so then we start ignoring the signals of the body. But I would say it's even more than that. You know, I think it's things like covid uh, took everyone up to, if they weren't already ratcheted up high, economy, the war, other parts of the world happening. So this awareness of fear, fear is the stimuli pre predominantly for the sympathetic system. And um, and we live, I think, much more in a state of fear. So so talk about Ukraine some more. Like, uh, you know, we we you talked about you know the mind let's talk about the physical side and what you're doing and and how it maybe even how it got started doing it yeah it is a wild ride so um i would say um the first thing was you know i'd been a instructor at the rady center of executive development at ucsd and this material i had developed for decades but it started taking more shape and form around, you know, conquer crisis, train like a triathlete, body, mind, purpose. Yeah. Um, 
or business, depending on the audience. And so then it's, there's one slice of it that's really around the neuros, well, all of it's neuroscience based, but around the neuroscience of calming in the midst of chaos. And so I began to work with individuals, executives, um, you know, 500, um, Fortune 500 companies, people that were you know, realizing their people were in such high levels of extreme stress. And so we were able to help train them. And it's actually super simple. That's mm-hmm. the thing. It's so profoundly simple that we started watching these really significant shifts happen. And I was amazed. They were amazed. Now the key is to keep building and strengthening that neural pathway that already exists to reset, reset, reset. And the longer and the more you reset, the more ability you have to be able to adjust to any situation. So all this transpires and then the war breaks out. Well, I I don't think I even knew where Ukraine, I mean, I knew where Ukraine was. That's <laughs> not, didn't think about Ukraine much though. I didn't. Um, so when this war broke out, I had a real um, passion for it that I couldn't even explain. And as a result, people are saying, or, do you think you're supposed to go? And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Hmm. And so I, within two weeks, I end up in Ukraine. So maybe about three hours before I get on the plane. Now I've got like seven suitcases and people from Young Life are bringing me things to take to the Ukraine. And I'm like, sure, I didn't even know we had Young Life in Ukraine. I'll do it. <laughs> and so all this stuff is being piled in. And I get this little inkling, huh? I wonder if I should take any of my neuroscience stuff. Can't imagine this would work in a war zone. Plopped it in three hours before I head to the airport. Within probably 36 hours of landing, I'm training my first group. Young life leaders, people, everyone is on the front lines. Like this was the beginning of month three. Everything is high alert state. And so at this juncture, I've got like a Jewish rabbi, uh, Messianic Church, um, Shimon and Nathalie, Rabbi Shimon. Then we've got Young Life, uh, Fedora and Lena. And then we've got Heroes International. And I take people through this. And all of a sudden they're like, they're meeting the next day saying, how can we disseminate Jill all around Ukraine? At that point, they put me in a car, take me across the border into Ukraine because I was in Moldova and literally drop me with... Um, Military people, I don't know. They can't even go with me because it's an undisclosed military base. And all of a sudden, I'm being interviewed by psychologists, soldiers, chaplains, first responders saying, we want to know what you know. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? (laughs) So um, it worked. And I was like, I can't believe this is working. I don't know. And I believed it, but now I really believe it. Really believe it. So here's a key question I asked everyone. Um, I said, once they become integratively aware of how much stress their body is dealing with and the high level, they say, I ask them, what what percent of this level of anxiety, stress, overwhelm, did you feel before the war? What do you think their answer was? What percent? Probably pretty low. I would say... 10, 15%? Nope. They said 100%. All of it? 100. They had felt that high level of stress before the war ever broke out. Now, I asked another question. How, what percent of you felt this high level of stress in the body before COVID? What do you think they said? Well, gosh, now I feel like I should counter all of my intuitions and say exactly uh well they must have said zero but i wanted to say a hundred percent they said a hundred percent really so here's what i found so what that tells me and that's why i'm so convinced about our work and is that the battlefield of the mind is 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 just as difficult if not more than the actual war zone of ukraine so that's what we proved in the battlefield uh, that the battlefield of the mind is the same battlefield as we discovered in Ukraine. What a whirlwind. Isn't that the wildest thing? It doesn't even make logical sense, but it shows that we have this capacity 
Mm-hmm. We have this capacity and we're meant to live in it. So it's already there. All we have to do is re-strengthen it. We yeah. fed the fear. We haven't fed the peace and calm because we didn't know how. We've kind yeah. of lost the ability. So we've developed now, not only we do we have the full-on training that we do anywhere, corporations, organizations, and all of that, or keynotes, all of this helps us with our work in Ukraine, Right. Right. So you are multiplying yourself through that stuff Mm -hmm. by giving people the the tools to teach it to others. So, so cool. Um, Okay. I'm going to put a pin in it because we might come back to it towards the end, but I want to ask you kind of the central question for the podcast, which, uh, and, and context, you know, this podcast is intended to be an encouragement for people in the middle of hard seasons. And uh, I just really believe, we believe that, uh, the, one of the best ways to do that is give people a different perspective because it's really hard to get outside of your current situation when you're in it. Like when you're in a valley, how do you see outside of the valley? And you need somebody to offer that perspective that's been where you yeah. are now. And so, so the, like stories seem to be a really compelling way for people to latch on to those perspectives and to gain some hope. And so people that have been there, that have walked in the valley can share those stories for someone in the middle. Like hopefully that encourages. If you enjoy the podcast, please do us a favor and head to your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. It helps a ton. And there's a reason all the podcasts you listen to ask you to do this. We want to continue to encourage people in the middle of their difficult seasons and your ratings help boost our podcast visibility and the stories of our guests. Did you pause it and leave a review? If so, thank you. All right, all right. Back to our conversation. And the question is, what's the hardest thing in your life that you wouldn't take back? And then, you know, the follow-up to that is why? Wow. Um, Wow. I would have totally taken it back until I went to Ukraine. Mm. So Um, recently it's changed. Only recently did all of the loss, all of the devastation, all of it all of the despair. Um, only when I went to Ukraine, could I finally say, I am thankful for every scar because there is a part mm. of my story now that I could relate with every refugee, soldier, mother, babushka. I felt like I could relate with everyone at least a little bit. And they did too. So for me, I was traveling the world. I was you know, training in leadership. I loved my life. I loved my work. And then my entire world collapsed. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had two kids had been married 23 years. I go through a horrific divorce. Um, Not my choosing, but it happened. And um, then my very best friend of 32 years, right at the time I'm going through this uh, dies. We had walked through eight years of cancer. My dad dies. My aunt dies. We lose our home. My children are really struggling. And basically, I am devastated. And yeah. um, I got to the point where then we had to move, uh, leave even the town that we loved. So we had to leave to, we went off to California. Right before we leave for California, our home is broken into. Uh, the few things we have left are stolen. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to reset my nervous system and I'm going to jump in my car and go for a run. I go to jump in my car. Our car is stolen. And everything in the car was my special everything. Not my daughter's, not my son's, but mine. I was totally devastated. And then we had to somehow pick everything up. I've got to look like, what are you going to look like as a single mom driving across California with your daughter in the car? You're going to look like you got it together. So you don't mm-hmm. instill fear into them. Well, I was terrified and we had just <laughs> totally over and we had obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And I really thought I never was going to be able to pull myself back up. I got so low and I'm a natural optimist. You can probably pick that up, yeah. but I got so low that I felt like my face had been just crushed into the ground and there was no hope. No Mm -hmm. hope. Everything I loved was gone. Everything. And there's more to that. And finally, 
um, I think I got sort of to the full end of myself and just said, man, I, I can't do it anymore. And um, I, I felt like that got out of purpose for me and yeah. I had to focus on that no matter, it didn't matter. I had to leave everything that I lost behind and I was still aching for it. And I had to stop aching what's ahead, what's ahead. And so I'm telling you the hardest times of my entire life. And I, once I started what I would call building, um, I would call them, I, you know, I, I do believe in building muscle and building strength, good sleep, all these things that I do, um, not perfectly, but I do still love my chocolate, but I started building muscles of faith. No, I know the vision. I will move forward regardless of what I've lost that I loved with all my heart. And, yeah. and I have found all of it coming back in a way I never could have imagined. And least of all Ukraine. So while the greatest fear was to go to war, the greatest gift was to go to war because mm. there. I'm telling you, Dan, you see what matters. What they're doing there is they're all coming together. They're not fighting one another. They're not competing. They are fighting a common enemy. And we are family fighting the common enemy. You can see what matters. Couples are getting married. They are having babies in the midst of war. People are finding faith. They are binding together. In the U.S., we're fighting each other. We're yeah. fighting ourselves in our own battlefield of the mind. And so for me, actually one of the most gorgeous places to be, and I'm not going to say I'm not afraid, um, but I choose to go anyway, because I now know we have something that works and I cannot not, I cannot unsee what I've seen. Yeah. So the clarity is I got to go. And, and I've had bombs so close. I thought that was it. Um, and it's not like I have some kind of death wish or martyrdom thing. I really love life. <laughs> I really want to live a long life. I really want to live. But uh, I would say I have been to the highest of the high and the darkest of the darks. And then once I literally, I believe, was a call of faith and purpose to war, found my purpose fully coming back into alignment in a way that I could never have done on my own. Yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like. Job. I felt like I'm Job and Joseph all together. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people go through like, yeah. you know, I should, and I'm not saying this flippantly, but a lot of people go through a divorce or a lot of people go through some health issues or a lot of, but like to have it. And a lot of people go through multiple, but like kind of staggered, but to have them just kind of hit like one, two, three, Eight. four, five, six, seven, like, and set like perpetually and one yeah. on top of each other. Like that's not a normal story. I don't think. And I, well, I wonder like, were, did you have a faith at that time? That's a good question. I absolutely have had a faith most of my life. And I always attach it to John 10, 10, which says, you know, Hey, you know, you're going to live life to the fullest. Okay. That's what I signed up for. But I totally came this close to losing my faith after it was like the rug yeah. got pulled up. I'd get back up, bam, I'd get back up, bam, again, 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 such rapid fire that I went into full on. I not only was I devastated, I was in despair Yeah, and I couldn't see the way forward. And people who knew me were like, oh my gosh, she's lost hope. And I had lost hope. And, yeah. um, and I'm telling you, I now know what that feels like. And there's a blessing in it because I can help others who feel that devastated. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, to be honest, I have trained myself in so much of this that I had to train myself again. And here's, I'll tell you one thing I did um, that was really critical. I knew my mind, I was waking up still in tears and going to bed at tears. And I know there are other people and I, I again, natural optimist. So um, I decided I was going to write down 100. And for me, it's scripture. So people have different things, right? So for me, it's scripture about strength and about hope and about joy. And you know what? I wrote down 100. And then I got myself a clicker. And just like an athlete, I did 100 a day. I spoke them out loud, thought them. I mean, I tried to feel, think I didn't the first and for 30 days, 100 a day, click, click, click. 
And then I went, "Mm, I'm only feeling a little bit better. I know how the brain works. We're going another 30 days, the same 100. Click, click, click. I start to feel a little bit of it when I'm doing it this time, right? Then I got done with that and I went, all right, 30, 30, 30, here we go. And I did it again for 30 days. And then I started seeing real change in my mind, in my body, in my breath, in my cells, in my dreams, in my thoughts, in my words. And every so often I would say probably once a week, I'm doing another hunt, the same hundred for 30 days. I mean, not 30 days for a couple of days reset yeah. because it is, um, I understand that's been the side I allowed my mind to tell me lie after lie after lie. And we just need to expose the lies and, and all they are is a thought. They don't have power over this, but we give it power. So yeah. we've got to, we can choose our thoughts. And it's not pretending. This isn't really pretending. I tried that back in high school, trying to pretend things were okay. This wasn't about pretending. It's choosing to believe things um, before they come into being. And yeah. um, so it it has been, I mean, I every tool I, I've designed or um, packaged, every single tool I have used. So it's not like, mm-hmm. oh, that's a good idea. It's not like, let's just read about it. No, I have been on the floor practicing these things. So- they're proven not only in my own life, but in the war zone of Ukraine and yeah. in the battlefield of the mind in the U.S. So when you when you think back to that season, how long was that season from what? So was the divorce the first thing that? Kind of well, it off? all sort of my friend was going through cancer. Things were going wonky. So the divorce was the big tipping point. And then she okay. passed away after that. I really thought she wasn't. And that was my greatest support system, um, you know, hands down. And then I saw my kids struggle and tank and, and from there, everything else tanked. I would say, um, honestly, I'm going to be honest. It was a freaking decade of despair. Mm. Decade. Yeah. Bar none decade. Now I would pull myself up for a bit and then I'd get smashed down again. So it was relentless. Um, I felt like there was some force trying to wipe me out. And I was out of gas again, again, again. And um, so I'm not going to lie. It was a decade. I felt like Joseph and Job both combined. um, And I didn't think there was any hope for me. I was that. I mean, I'm a hopeful person. But then, okay, so here's the key, I think. I began to realize I was, what's the word? I was folding. I was allowing the past, all the loss to drown me in quicksand. Okay. That's what I was doing. And I realized I had to get up and fight. I had to fight. And I was like, that's where the whole warrior powered by love came from. Mm -hmm. I got this seven years ago and my mind designed it back when we lived in California before we came to Colorado. And at that point I began to realize I don't have a fighting spirit. I I'm just getting flattened. I don't want to fight. I didn't want to fight. But you know what? In this world, the freaking world is fighting. So we need to fight for the most powerful force on heaven and on earth, which is love. And that's, you know, no one knows that more than a parent. You're going to fight for the best for your child. And that means you're going to stand up when it's tough. So for me, that whole warrior powered by love came from me learning, okay, instead of fighting against myself, or inside myself, I'm going to fight for myself and for the purpose I believe God's placed me on earth for. So this is really the key to me is, yeah, we need to fight. The problem is we're fighting each other. That's ridiculous. That's a waste. We need to be fighting for the greater good, the strongest force in heaven on earth with his love. And that's what I believe I had to learn the excruciatingly hard way. Yeah, it it's like yeah, <laughs> 10 years is a long time. It was and, awesome. <laughs> and I you, you know, even I'm sure you would look back and go, yeah, it was a long time. It was and, a long time. And I'm sure it felt even longer in the middle of it than it does oh. now. Not to say it doesn't look like a long time. 10 years is a long time, but like I can't even imagine what 10 years feels like in 10 years, you know? Mm-hmm. I like And And I didn't look it on the outside. So let me, many people that are fighting these kinds of battles, they don't look it on the outside. They do not look it on the outside because 
It isn't because I didn't want to show the world. Well, maybe a little bit, but you can't walk around. I mean, you can, but I don't think it's going to go too well for you. So I didn't want to present myself that way. I don't think I was faking, but I was trying to choose a better way all the time. Mm. And yet I was tormented by fear, overwhelm. And that's why I think the training that I offer is so valuable because I've lived it. I had to fight out and through it. And I no one came to my rescue. No one came in, swooped in and made my world better um, uh, other than God, to be honest. But he still made me fight for it. He yeah. did not just go, let me lift you out of this really difficult time, Jill, and everything's been. no, no, no. I felt like he made you get up, you fight, you stand. And now I get it. Now I totally understand. But man, it was not pretty. It was not pretty. And it's it's almost like, you know, your kids are too young now, Dan, but like when you get into like junior or like when they get into high school, right? You your kids have to fight for good grades. You can't do that for them. I mean, I guess right. you could, but it's not too pleasant. Not you know, they've either. got to do for themselves. Yeah. They've got to learn to stand up for themselves. They've got to learn to choose what they want. They, there's a level of fighting for yourself and for the fullness, I think, of life to the fullest that we were put here for. And there's no question in my mind that every single human being that is here has a distinct, individual, and vital, important purpose. And it's not about size. It's not about war. It's not about any of this. It's not about big versus little. It is about your unique purpose with your gifts, your abilities. There are people in the world. You can touch Dan. Other people can touch. I could never. They wouldn't respond to me. I'm just a little too animated or I'm a little too. (laughs) I know I'm too, too. Right. And that's okay. I'm not supposed to be able to reach everyone. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. It makes a ton of sense. And I, I, that's why this like, you know, question and these stories are so fascinating, right? Because not every story resonates with every person and that's somebody's true. story may resonate at different times for different people. And yeah, it's the same thing with the Bible, right? Like I could, I've read the Bible for a long time and I've read these same stories for a long time. And then I'll be in a certain situation or mindset or experience. And all of a sudden this has new life and it resonates in a new way that didn't, ever have any meaning before, but it's, you know, I have the attunement to that at this point. You know, and one, one thing I'm getting kind of, I, I, I love this. Um, one of the books that I've studied, um, forever has been man's search for meaning, uh, by Victor Frankl. Yeah. And I've actually spent, uh, I've been to doc out three times and I wanted to go, I've always searched out this. I don't know why. Um, but one of the things he says, from losing everyone except his sister. I think he learned, lost his mother, his brother, his wife. And he was, a, I think, a psychologist or psychiatrist. He was uh, Jewish and ended up in um, Auschwitz and Dachau. And during this time, he began to study people and what gave them the ability to stay and live amidst the horrific atrocities, right? What was it? What was it? And he realized it was their purpose. And if they could hold on even by a thread to their unique purpose, like your son is fighting to see you alive again, hang on, hang on, you're what they're fighting for, you know, then people could live. But one of the things he said that I will never forget is that we have enough to live by, but we have little to nothing to live for. Mm. We have the means, but no meaning. And to me, that is the most rampant thing in the world today. And that's where we get lost. We fight each other instead of fighting a common enemy and for each other. Whether we agree or not is inconsequential. And one of the gifts, if you can say it to Ukraine, which, you know, it's horrific, it's terror that's happening, but Ukrainians have pulled together. They have pulled together with all the differences that they had, like we had. They have pulled together. They see now what matters most. And so us recognizing that we each have a purpose, but collectively, it's that much stronger. Collectively, so much stronger. So, you know, our little movement of becoming a global warrior powered by love is about how are you fighting for love? And I don't care if that's at the grocery. I do care. That could be at the grocery store. It can be your neighbor. And and 
honestly, Mother Teresa said this, um, you can find Calcutta in every part of the world, wherever you have eyes to see the lonely, the forgotten. I don't, that could be in a mansion. I've, I've met it all over the place. So people, we have a purpose and mm. your life matters. And there is someone that needs you to reach out, right? You to be living a sense of purpose. So they feel valued. And, yeah. and so there's, I think that's really for me at the crux of all of this. Yeah. So I'm going to tie this question to just, a, I think an observation, it sounds like this Ukrainian uh, experience for you has um, assigned some purpose to the decade of pain. And oh, I think that's the best way to say it. Yeah. Like I thought it was a wash, a waste. My life's over. I'm going to live in, you know, some basement somewhere and, you know, whatever. Now I was building strength uh, after probably year 10. <laughs> um, I started building strength. Here's my puppy. If you want to say hi, there, that's there he is. Hello. say hello. Um, so I was building strength. Um, but it wasn't, you're right. I, I couldn't make sense of the devastation for me. Family is the most important. So the devastation of the family being torn apart the holidays and so many of us experienced that. And it is so hard. So on my Christmas, you're going to see single moms here that, you know, are from all different parts of the world, actually, mm. in my living room, right? And because I understand what it's like. So I would say, yes. Uh, once I got there, I realized literally a beautiful um, woman who had been, you know, displaced in her own country comes up in tears after hearing just a short part of my story takes off a bracelet, puts it on me and just holds me and says, I can't believe you have the courage to come and the courage to share your story so we can be strengthened. Mm -hmm. So they felt like, oh my gosh, she's had to move Not knowing anyone. We've had to move, leave our home. She, her, everything was stolen. We had to leave everything behind. We all, you know, my best friend died. Her best friend died. You know, my husband's at war. They're a soldier. So, so many pieces I could relate to that um, I think gave them a level of strength to see I built my strength back. It's possible. I gave them yeah. some hope. And yeah. uh, and I, I cannot not go back. I love it. I'm grateful. I'm, people ask me this one last question I'll say is people say, are you, oh, so you're not scared anymore. And I go, oh, <laughs> are you kidding me? I know exactly what I'm going into. I'm going into a war zone. No, I'm totally aware. Um, but I've decided that, um, I cannot not go. Yeah. Cannot not go. Yeah. It's not an option to not go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, cause I think there's so much richness that can be drawn from what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, like your valley that you could be in can be really long and it can feel really hopeless. And, you know, there, there's opportunity to kind of shape that for yourself by, by identifying what's true and, and combating the lies that exist in your mind and like rewiring, resetting, but also like continuing to live life, understanding like that, that there is purpose, even though it doesn't feel like it. And you, it may just not be, you may not know it yet. And, um, because I, Here's like, I struggle with that and I'm in a good life, you know, like I, I don't have all the hardship that you just described. Not even close. I don't have all the hardship that exists in a war situation. Not even close. And I struggle with like, all right, well, like, what am I doing? You know, I think we all have to, have to ask that question. Like, okay, I'm Dan, why are you selling jump ropes? Like, what is, what am I doing with that? And, and the question of meaning does matter a ton. And it becomes kind of like exacerbated, I think, when we're in hard seasons. Like that's when we really sit down and go like, well, I need to understand this because there's there has to be a reason. You know, and then that's when we start talking to God about it. And we're like, God, why? You know, we don't talk to God about why life's good. We talk to God about like, why life's hard. We go, God, why? Like, why do you have me here? I don't understand it. And uh, what's, I think, encouraging in your story is that even if you don't know while you're in it, like you can have hope. Well, I, yeah, well, no saying that from retrospect. So let me just kind of give you, 
I thought there was no hope. I felt like God didn't give me a, a flying F about me. I'm just yeah. going to be honest. I was Which is great. Special. Yeah, be honest. I was as special. And now let's just throw her into prison and strip everything away from her. And that's what I felt. And yeah. I felt like he loved everybody else but me. He had totally forsaken me. So mm. that's how low my faith got. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I finally kind of did a bargain with him. You know, I sort of did this, have it out with him. And I think he can handle it. I was like, listen, I don't believe you care one ounce about me, but you love everybody else. And I, I literally had this discussion saying, now this is how this is going to play out. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, I am, I am, I'm going to pretend that you love me because at least when I knew you did, I felt better. Mm. And I'm not going to sing. I love you because my love is totally conditional. And, um, that's kind of how it's going to go. And that's, and I was still even going to church during this time. And I was still allowing myself. I still never fully gave up, but I did believe he gave up on me. Yeah. And I did believe he did not care about me at some level. I knew that he did. So for me, that was the biggest crisis of my faith. Now I would say when you get that low, don't go it alone. Do not you, I didn't have the fortitude to start fighting this battle without others coming in and saying, we love you. We see you. Like I had to sort of go to a, I, I didn't, you know, it's almost like, I, I feel like God sort of supplied this group of people to come around me and say, we know what you're designed for. We know you're wounded to the core mm. and we love you. And we're going to stand by you. And uh, that started re, I, I think we all just need family. You know, I just didn't yeah. have, you know, my kids were doing what they're supposed to be doing, but I, I didn't have any family. And so my parents are both gone and um, I didn't have anyone that really like, was there. And so they became that and began, I feel like, to sort of heal the heart in me and show me who I really was. So I, I feel like at that point, it's almost like you're in the hospital. No, I wasn't, but you're in the hospital and you can't feed yourself, you know, for people who visit, someone feeds you. They were feeding my heart. They were feeding my heart. And then I gained enough strength to begin to fight for myself. But mm. that to me was a God blessing. I, I never would have seen that in a million years coming. Yeah, yeah. that was totally a miracle. Mm -hmm. So let, I kind of want, let's end on this question yeah. and one more. Um, you know, you've talked about you know, for the 10 years that it was like you didn't show it. You know, it was like, I, I am strong enough or I am not like, I'm sure there are moments where it slipped out, but like, generally speaking, you were trying to put on a, a put together or strong face. It sounds like, or you at least have said that a couple of times. Yeah. I, it wasn't pretending. I don't think it was just functioning like, mm. um, you know, I was a single mom. I didn't have yeah. a choice. It, nobody, get nobody behind me doing anything. You know, and so, you know, so people knew like people were aware of of what you were going through. And because what I wanted to ask was like, friends did, but but yeah. they have their own families and lives and they couldn't just come and help. And mm -hmm. I just needed sometimes help. And so if you know a single mom, I've never experienced anything more difficult, Um, not because my my kids were difficult. It's because I just felt so it felt so heavy all the time. You know, there's no one to do dishes or grocery shopping or even put trash out or you never felt like anyone had your back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after 23 years of marriage and then, you know, 14 years of single, not on my top 10 list, <sighs> right, of things I ever wanted to go through. And I'm really built for family. I'm really built for commitment. I'm really built for um, certainly not built for the dating life. Um, I don't love that scene. So my home is filled with young adults, which it will be in less than an hour. You yeah. know, they're our warrior boot camp, and I pour into other people. Um, because yeah. I'm just not out in the dating scene. Um, and so I would say that I don't think I pretended you have to move forward. The world will not stop for you. Mm -hmm. You must move forward. So I encourage you to find that person or two. And then I, it's not like my training is the only thing. So please don't misunderstand. Um, but I've seen some people come in and amazing things happen. 
So it's just one. There are many ways to be healed. There are many ways to experience healing. So this is just one. Um, but we're seeing it be really, really successful. So April might be the perfect training for some folks uh, here in Denver. People have flown in from all over uh, the U.S. Um, and we're we're limited number of spots because we really want to go deep with folks. Um, and we don't talk about it. It's not psychology. So it's a, a little bit, it's definitely a different approach. So that could be one thing if you feel that tug or pull. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just trying to say there is something out there. Mm -hmm. um, that I used that helped me to yeah. really uh, transform. So I would say you do need to get, you got to get back up. If you're here and you wake up the next morning, you're meant to be on this planet. You got to get back up. You got mm -hmm. to get back up, but prayerfully you will find one or two people that can just believe in you as you are getting back up. But at the end of the day, nobody's going to fight for you. But yeah. You, yeah. People will, will need you as you do it, but they can't do it for you. No, nobody can do it for nobody can go to the gym for you and build your muscle. Right. This doesn't happen that way. And so I would have loved that. And I was pouring into so many people, but nobody, I didn't feel it going on here, mm -hmm. um, but that began to change. And my ability to see people that were doing things and were stepping in and things begin to change over time. But it was because I allowed myself to go so deep into the despair and the loss and the pain, it took a while to get out. Yeah. So the faster you can circumvent it, I guess that's another reason why the training is what it is. Right. That's yeah, it's what you started talking about. You know, how do we cut the trauma off before it becomes right. a full, right. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to not ask some questions for the sake of time, but okay. I, I do want to ask you how people who uh, maybe you said something that was really impactful. Maybe like they do need some help and some training or like, but how can they like keep up with what you're doing? You mentioned your website earlier. Jill yeah, well, we're, but... we're scrambling to keep up too, to be honest. So bear with us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you can totally connect with us on LinkedIn, Jill Tupper. Uh, and we're trying to get someone that can kind of keep that updated more. If people, um, it really does help. If people want to bring us in for corporate leadership, uh, for keynotes, this will all not only make a huge difference, I call it the neuroleadership training, but um, not only will it be significant for your people, but this will help us on the not-for-profit side, Yeah, our global warriors uh, powered by love. And then you can go to my website, Jill Tupper. Um, then you could also, uh, Instagram is our tiny little following right now, but share it, share it, because that's the only thing I figured out how to do, boots on the ground in Ukraine. So it's not pretty. It's me doing it unless somebody's going to dive in. So um, that's just Jill Tupper. Super simple. Um, and then, you know, our YouTube's not great because we just need somebody to do that. Um, we've got, I think those are the primary ways to connect. If you want to give, um, you 100% of your gift is boots on the ground. So you'll find that on our Ukraine page, again, on my website. It should be sort of in the you know, the bio of Facebook and LinkedIn or, um, I'll and, track it down and put it in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah. and, but, and then people are volunteering all over the place. People are coming to the training, which is April. Uh, you'll see it on my website, <laughs> but it's in April. Uh, and we've got a round one and round two, and then some people want to go to Ukraine. Others people want to train here. So I believe we're being called to create a global 1.5 response team. Mm. And, uh, so I think this is a significant movement. It's not me just, and, and let me just say this in closing. I love credit. I have got my, I got my marathon. I'll bring them out. I'll show you my medal, <laughs> you know, marathons, triathlons, that were racing. And I've never, I'm not even a big deal, but I can tell you, I can't take any credit for this. The only thing I can say is I jumped out of a boat into the raging ocean and because of every dark thing I've learned to fight through and become a warrior powered by love, now, now a purpose much greater than myself and a force much more powerful is moving through me. That's it. It's not me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm humbled every day, every, every day, every day I'm humbled. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's encouraging, I think, to like, one, hear your story, but two, just to like you know, separate the story aside, if I didn't even know the history, but to know like what you're doing and the things that 
you're experiencing and learning and to hear like of the the purpose that you recognize even in the difficulty of the war and like all of that it's just bigger than normal life and a reminder that life is bigger and uh better than i think it feels a lot of the time so it's well, super I think they're really what is einstein say it may not be exact but imagination is more powerful than knowledge I think at the end of the day, we're crowning knowledge is the most important, but Google's got the market cornered on that stuff. But right. what we've lost is the ability, not lost, but we need to re-center uh, the ability to imagine the innovation that's needed to heal this world. And mm. so many of us are limiting ourselves without realizing it. And that's why this training opens you to be able to begin to visualize and see when you come into sync, your body, your mind, your emotions, your soul, you then can actually see with greater clarity the future rather than blinded by your own stuff. If that right. makes sense. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Well, Jill, this was, I, I think we probably, could, I could ask you questions for hours, I'm sure. And I would imagine you could talk to me if you had time, but you don't. And I want to respect that. And uh, I, yeah, I'll make sure that everything that you talked about goes in the show okay. notes. We'll link people so that if they're interested, they thank can you. connect with you. And uh, I just want to say like, thank you one for uh, the work that you're doing and all like putting your life on the line essentially, right. For, for folks. Uh, and then two, thanks for like taking time out of your really busy schedule to share your story and uh, encourage folks who are listening. Uh, very grateful. Well, and thank you because I think, stories are the most impactful. And I talk about it in terms of we all need to take inspired action. And I've just for so much of my life taken action, but not necessarily inspired. Mm. So each of us has a unique touch on the world. It doesn't matter if it's one person or hundreds of thousands. And Mother Teresa started with one. And mm. the size is not is, is irrelevant. But the key that you are using that which you've been given to make a difference in the world, you will strengthen yourself as well as those that you touch. So it's, it's the world is, is ready for more warriors powered by love at the end of the day. Mm. It's ready. Let's go. You well, know? I can't say better than that. So uh, yeah, again, Jill, thank you for, for being on and uh, yeah, have a very safe and blessed trip to Ukraine here in the next few weeks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Be well. Blessings, guys. Thanks for listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. We hope you are encouraged today and have a newfound hope to persevere. Be sure to subscribe for more great episodes and conversations. And if you ever want to watch an episode, check out our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash Elite SRS. Have a blessed day.